My name is John Edelman. I'm the former CEO of Design Within Reach and Edelman Leather, the former president of Be Original Americas, and now I've transitioned to the fantastic role of ambassador. As ambassador, I get to do the fun part of the job of Be Original America and meet and speak to uh, fascinating, interesting people. Today, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Oyvind Slato from Copenhagen. We recorded our session some weeks ago as Oyvind was going to be on vacation, as you'll see soon that he is uh, at this time. The good news is that with luck, and we got the luck, he's with us from a remote island outside of Denmark. And he'll, he'll disclose the location when, he, when you finally see him. Oyvind designed the Patera for Louis Paulson uh, in his way, simple and a poetic solution. We're going to learn what that means and his philosophy as we go on uh, to the interview. Uh, Oyvind is also designed for other fantastic Danish brands such as Bang & Olufsen and Le Clint. Very important, at the conclusion of our talk, we'll get Oyvind live in the middle of nowhere and have a, a, a live Q&A. So have fun, have as much fun as we did speaking, listening, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you in the post-interview question and answer period. Thanks. Hello, and thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Oyvind Slotto, and I'm a designer uh, based in Denmark, uh, Copenhagen, or in Copenhagen, Denmark. I run a small studio, and some of the products I've made is what you can see on this um, uh, screen. Maybe you know the speaker on the floor, it's called A9 for Danish high-end audiovisual uh, manufacturer Bang & Olufsen. To the right, you see a lamp for Le Clint, and to the left, you see another lamp for Louis Paulson, and I will go a little bit more in details with this specific lamp later in this webinar. On the wall, you also see a wall-mounted um, turntable, which is a conceptual work I did, and also the, the egg-shaped chair, a balancing, balancing chair. Um, so I balance my work with uh, uh, working for, for external clients, but also some of the projects are started by myself, especially if it's something I find quite important or I simply just can't let be to, to make it. Um, I very often work with some uh, focus areas, um, such as uh, mind and focus. Um, right now, our mind is the battlefield for some very powerful players. They are fighting for our attention and turning us into some stressed zombies. Uh, this small device you see here is a completely analog way to help us keep track of time. Uh, so if you turn it like this, you have 45 minutes before the sand is coming from the upper chamber to the lower one. And after this, uh, you have 15 minutes break because this is, if you turn it upside down, this is what it takes for the sand to go back to the, to the first chamber again. 15 minutes is what is needed for the brain to recover after working. So it's a way to help you have these essential breaks. Another way to work with the same focus is this larger structure, which is a, a wall divider, a, a room divider, uh, which is blocking out distractive uh, distractions while allowing the light to float uh, freely through the room. Another focus area is sustainability. Um, and this is an example for Danish uh, furniture manufacturer Magnus Olesen. Um, it's a circular chair uh, which is designed to never ever end on landfills. It's modular and by only replacing one single screw uh, the brass thing you can see here, you can explain, uh, replace any component, repair it, and then you have a completely new chair. The broken component can then be sent back to the factory, can be refurnished and be sold in a new chair, as a new chair. Uh, the last focus area is society. Right now, as you know, we have a global pandemic and a pandemic is a global problem and should be solved in a global way not by competing regional, local, national, uh, international, but we should actually collaborate. So I designed this uh, face protection shield together with a friend. At that time, it was the first mono uh, material face shield. Uh, and we then enabled everyone who wants to manufacture them to download it for free and start production. Right now, this is manufactured in Brazil, in um, South Africa, in Japan, in Europe, and all over the world. And hopefully this will help 
to stop the pandemic. And of course, we can't do it ourselves. But as a designer, it's quite nice to somehow contribute with, with what you can do. Um, my long-term vision is to be able to, to make much more of this kind of work where we actually do something good for society. I'm not there yet, but I hope that I can really uh, increase this, this, uh, this area. Another part of, of uh, what I'm doing is that I'm part of the Danish Art Foundation, the, the jury. The Danish Art Foundation is a governmental institution that is helping designers um, by giving them space and time to uh, focus and um, make even better design. Uh, design is something that takes time. Just as a good writer is not only writing, he is or she is rewriting. A good designer is you design and then you redesign, redesign, redesign. It's a very time consuming process. And uh, it's not always that you have time to do this in a, um, well, in the world we live in. So the Danish government has decided to actually give designers some extra time by grants. Uh, and I'm now a part of the jury of this commission for four years. And we try to, in this way, make sure that the Danish uh, design culture will continue in the future. Now we'll tell you a little bit about my design philosophy. Um, so what you see here is um, a lot of sheep. Um, as you all know, uh, following the trend and finding the trend is something uh, people are spending a lot of money on because uh, it's important to find the latest trend and oh we should be trendy and not be yesterday and so on and for this sheep it's very important to follow the trend because if it goes outside of the crowd it will be eaten by the wolf within seconds however as a designer I cannot allow myself to design based on the current trend because when I do a design it will take months or years before it's into production and I'm not a sheep either um, instead of try to make some design which is not based on trends. Because if you want to make long lasting aesthetics, you are not allowed to create design based on trends. Uh, Henry Ford, he put it that way. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Don't ask people what they want, but give people what they need. If we would ask people what they want, then we get Brexit and Donald well. <clears throat> so instead, we should uh, design for life and with a you know, really respect for life and try to do things which is really good for people and good for life and create some aesthetics which is made for life and not only for the current trend. Actually, nature and life is the best master of design and aesthetics. And I would say any creative person should study nature, not to copy it, but to find out some of the principles and learn from this. Uh, I will show you some examples of design principles which I found in nature and then turned into man-made objects. What you see here is, uh, are some sunflowers. And I turned this into the patera for Louis Paulson. I will show you more about this lamp later on this presentation. Or this one is if you zoom into a snowflake, which I used when I designed the Biosound shape for Bang & Olufsen. This is a modular speaker and sound absorbing system, which you can uh, put on your wall as you want. So you won't ever see two equal of these uh, speaker walls because everyone will make it different. Or this one is a Nautilus, which you can find in the swirl lamp for a Leclint. Um, so in this way, I try always to, to get inspired by nature, but it's not because nature is, uh, everything needs to look like nature, but simply because I, I like to follow some kind of logic, um, to find something which is true. What you see on the screen now is a jester or a joker. And in my point of view, this is what a designer should be. Uh, designers in Denmark are one-man companies most of the time. I think 99% of the industry is one-man companies. 
and as such, you are a really small uh, company and can take huge risks. A joker is this character coming to the king, telling the king, not telling the king what everyone else is telling to the king, but actually telling the king, making fun of the king, and saying what nobody else is allowed to tell the king. Because everyone else is trying to tell the king what the king needs to hear, wants to hear, designer, we should not tell the king, which is the company or our client, what the client wants to hear. We should challenge our client and try to make some visions, take some risks and find out what we really believe in ourselves. Uh, I will give you some examples where I kind of was a joker and did not follow the trend, but do what I really believe in. This was a trend for laptops in 2005 when I was participating in a laptops contest still studying at school. And my uh, idea was this uh, project, which is a laptop in 2005, and it was winning the contest. This is a speaker system from Sony 2012. And when I came to Bang & Olufsen, instead of making another box, I designed this speaker, uh, which was designed 2012, but it's still sold uh, today. So it's a, it's a typical piece of consumer electronics, which is still uh, in production eight years later. I'm very proud of that, actually. Well, this was a lamp trend in 2015, and then I designed this lamp for Louis Paulson, which I will tell you more about later. Or well, this is the speaker trend in 2017, small, small uh, speakers, and this was a trend in offices. And then I designed the Biosound shape speaker and sound absorbing system. The first lamp I showed to Louis Paulson was uh, this quite conceptual work. Uh, I had just finished school, and they invited me in. I told them I have another lamp, which I didn't, but I got my meeting. And prior to the meeting, I just started with brainstorming. I had a, a piece of paper, which is uh, made into circles, and then I was folding it. And what you see in the screen are all these different uh, ways uh, to, to shape this paper. Um, and here you see another module and uh, what you get out of bending it. The point is that when I do things, I don't know what I do. I first know it when I did it. So first you try to make a lot of things and then you analyze and try to understand what you did. So this was my studio back in 2007, which was my living room as well, six square meters. And now it was only four days before the meeting. So I was kind of panicking and I found out that, oh, uh, maybe this, we don't have a lamp. So I was going back to history and looking at one of my heroes, Louis, uh, 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 Paul Henningsen, which is, I think, one of the greatest designers in, in, in Denmark. He's not alive anymore, but his design is still alive and still manufactured. Maybe you know this design, the uh, famous PH5. Um, Paul Henningsen did not just make good looking objects. He was designing it out of some very mathematical, physical, um, more or less scientific uh, method where he really tried to get as much out of the light bulb as possible. So he created this geometry, which I also used when I designed my lamp. But I had learned a lot of things when making my uh, projects you saw before. And some of the methods I learned was then transformed into this uh, completely analog way to make a lamp. And this was the result. So this was uh, six hours prior to the meeting uh, in the middle of the night. So uh, Louis Paulson, they liked this light, uh, lamp and my way of working. And uh, they started to say, oh, but uh, couldn't you make uh, something else? Maybe uh, make light with some very different methods and, uh, or, or make it very sustainable, blah, 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 blah. And at that time, the LED was a very new power source and uh, nobody really knew how it would be on the market. So I tried to see, oh, maybe you can make some energy by uh, combining uh, lemons with the uh, uh, cables and so on. So uh, this is not me inventing this method, but I was inspired by it. So I made this lamp, which is a lamp and a fruit bowl. So you put all the lemons on the fruit bowl and when you uh, want to have light on, you simply put it on the side. And it was not very good because the lemons turned very poison. So they would kill everyone who was eating the lemons afterwards. So that's not very nice. Uh, but it gave a completely new uh, a geometry. So sometimes you can get new ways of looking by going out in, on, on the edges. Um, also, I made this lamp, which is a way to avoid glare uh, using very small LEDs. 
and also cooling. So when you turn it around very fast, you get this structure. And in this way, you have a, a, a lamp, which is more or less uh, uh, transparent. Uh, it's a quite nice thing, uh, but uh, of course it didn't work on the commercial market. I made lots of different uh, uh, concepts and in the end, I gave up. But some years later, I came up with this lamp. So I had learned from collaborating with Louis Paulton, I learned a lot about light, about geometry, and then I made this lamp and was approaching them. Um, and now I can tell you the official story about how this lamp was made. This story I will tell you now makes completely sense, but when I made it, it did not make sense. Very often you first understand the story when it has been made, but you don't know it afterwards. So now I tell you a fairy tale about this lamp. What you see here is the most essential light source in our universe. It's the sun. The sun is the center of everything. Light is also something which gives you warmth and it is uh, very important for humans. When we were able to domesticate light in this candle, we suddenly could have the fire inside of our home without burning up. Paul Henningsen, which you just saw before, he was very fascinated by the candle and he wanted to uh, bring the qualities of the candle into the light bulb. The light bulb at that time, uh, many decades ago, were very powerful and very strong and they were really causing a lot of glare. But also they made people look not very beautiful. So that's why Paul Henningsen constructed this very uh, sophisticated system for uh, uh, shading of the, the light source. And this enabled him to create a lamp where you never ever get the direct light. And this system was then transformed into a lot of lamps uh, which he made with Louis Paulson and they are still in production today, decades later. I based my design on some of the same principles so this is the principle of the Patera light, which are designed from the inside and out. It was only possible because I uh, have access to a computer, which Louis, uh, Paul Henningsen did not have back then. But it's based on exactly the same principles. Um, and you can ask yourself, so why does it look like with these spirals and where does that come from? And I can tell you, I didn't make it myself it's made by gravity. So what is gravity? Well, gravity is the basic force in our universe. It creates the horizontal and the vertical. Gravity is creating the rhythm of day and night and day and night. It's creating the rhythm of summer and winter, summer and winter. And this could make you think that the shape of life is a circle, but it's not. Because whenever you come back to the same point of the circle, you're one cycle older. So the way how life looks is like this. So you get born in the center and you get older and older and older and older and in the end you're dead. Fibonacci, the Italian mathematician, uh, also called Leonardo Bonacci, he was studying nature and he was able to find the hidden mathematics behind nature. And this kind of mathematics was what I used when I created the Patera. In the beginning, it was all in the computer, but then we turned it into reality after years of efforts. What I'm especially proud of with this lamp is that even though it's a completely circular sphere, the light is not going out in on the directional way, but it's all turned downwards where you need it. If you use many of them, it gives a very nice atmosphere, but can you also use it as a centerpiece in a space. Talking about how to use uh, lamps in a room, I will give you some examples uh, about light. This is an example from the Norwegian lighting artist, Daniel Rybakken. Imagine that you're inside of this room, and now imagine being inside of this room. So would you prefer to be here, or would you like to be here? 
Actually, it's exactly the same room. And here, this is not a window. You have some LEDs behind a curtain, tricking your brain to telling you, oh, you can easily escape out of this room. So with light, you can make a space bigger by having the light out in the corners or smaller by having a central light in the center. That can be good in a space which is too big, you can make it smaller. Too small, you can make it larger. Um, I think that's very fascinating. That was a Norwegian artist, uh, Daniel Rupaking. Uh, another artist made this um, piece, which gives completely uniform light. The uniform light is also something which is quite popular in, I think, in America and also Asia. This is Skidmore Architects. But the problem with this complete uniform light, this is what you know from, from, from Apple also, is that there are no shadows. And if there's no shadow, it's very hard to read the space and the room. Um, also, if it's completely uniform, you get kind of the same mood as you have in this foggy environment. We all know how we feel after too long time in a foggy environment. Uh, I get maybe not as happy as if there's direct sunshine. In my point of view, the most beautiful light is what you see here, where you have the contrast of direct lights, uh, direct sunshine, you have the filtered light, and you have the deep, deep shadow. The combination and the symphony of all these different grades of light and shadow is what makes a, a, a room easy to read. This is a room in daylight, and during the night, if you have only one light lamp open, it's, uh, it's kind of smaller. And now try to see how the space and the room is opening up as more light sources are turned on. This was kind of the, one of the very important lighting philosophies from Paul Henningsen. Um, and you can see another example where he have a light point in the, in the fire stove and the window and a lamp. And now try to see how the space is opening up as more and more lights are turned on. Um, so to make it very short, you could really make some very nice atmosphere by using light. Uh, instead of having one light which is giving very strong light and maybe very homogenic light, then try to make the symphony of lights uh, where you have a variation of light um, and always try to avoid glare. In the beginning of my career, I was sketching very analog, as you can see here, without using any kind of computer. And then I was optimizing um, using classical methods with uh, you know, like line and paper and copper wire and so on. And then with the computer, I used the same principles as before, but turned them digital. And today, of course, with a 3D printer and a lot of digital fabrication methods, we have a much more powerful tool to make prototypes. Uh, creating prototypes is very important when you create light, also when you create furniture, of course, and, and everything else, but especially when you create light, prototypes is something you just can't avoid to make because you only sense the light in the right way if you see it. Um, and no matter what you do, then everything is made to satisfy the eye, avoid glare, make it, easy to see things, but also make yourself beautiful so that people in the room are beautiful and you want to see the people. Um, and I hope also to create some very uh, nice life which gives energy and uh, well, it's not tiring you as you see in this room. And hopefully something which is, well, it can never be as good as the sun, but maybe not very much worse than that. Thank you very much. Wow. <clears throat> that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I need a bottle of wine and about two more hours of that presentation. I, I, have, I have a thousand questions to ask, but um, I will start with just a few if that's okay. First of all, I'm a huge fan and um, you know, I'm a person that uh, loves design and is smart enough to know that he's not a designer. So I have great admiration for, the, for your skills and, and how you go about it and your philosophy. Very, very inspiring. Uh, Thank you. You speak of gaining uh, inspiration from failure. 
I'd love to hear more about that. And you mentioned, you know, basically turning lemons into lemonade in the presentation, but can you go into that? I think many people today are, are so scared of failure that they're almost paralyzed yes. to move forward. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. Uh, in my point of view, failure is, uh, is extremely important. And uh, I always encourage people and especially kids to make as many failures as possible. Um, the biggest failure is not to admit that you make failures and the biggest failure is not to dare to do any failures. Um, I mean, making failure is a way to sense the world and to experiment and, and uh, well, try to see what happens if I do this, what happens if I do this and this and this and this. And if a child stops walking, if a child stops falling, uh, it will never learn how to run. Uh, and as designers, we're kind of um, explorers in the future. And we should try what happens if we do this and this and this and this and this. And if we stop daring to fail, we will never explore uh, parts of the future, which could be good to know. So yeah, failure is we wouldn't... very important. Yeah, <laughs> we wouldn't be on the moon today without, uh, without some failure. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the original Americas and it's a, it's a organization that you believe in so strongly. Um, so can we discuss your views on copies and knockoffs and you mentioned in, uh, that copying comes from fear. And so in my opinion, cowards copy. How do you balance inspiration uh, versus exploitation? Well, um, inspiration is everywhere. And uh, um, the thing is that only you can get inspired by what you get inspired by. And I get inspired by what I get inspired by. by. Of course, I can show you some things we, which you may, might not have seen if you would just pass it, but you have to find it yourself. Uh, and if you copy uh, without trying to look yourself, then you miss the chance and the opportunity to find something only you could find. So I would say, yes, you can copy. And of course, we're all learning from each other and we all get, I can learn from everyone. Um, but we should, when we teach, we should try to teach people to find things only what only they can find. You can help them get some methods, but only they can find, only you can find what you can find. And shouldn't, you should never cheat yourself or anyone else for what only you can find. And you'll cheat yourself when I you copy agree. somebody. Totally, you're not really a designer when you copy, right? It's, it's, um, it's totally cheating. Um, so I mentioned, you mentioned during your, your presentation, a symphony of light. And, I, and yes. I, I love that expression. And I know that you were on track to be a musician. And what, what parts of your inspiration come from, from the music side? And you know, how, do you balance that in? Do you miss it? Do you get the same fulfillment from this that you got in music? And, and how do they interrelate? Well, I would say it's all about the same. Uh, so when you, when you, not, okay, it, it's long time bef since I was a professional musician and I wouldn't be able to play in, uh, today because it, it really requires a lot of uh, 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 practice. Uh, but of course I have a lot of the uh, seeking is still the same. So when you, when you try to learn or play a, a master instrument, you have to practice and practice and practice and practice. But first of all, you need to hear what you want to play. So, and you won't need to hear it even though there's complete silence. And the ability to hear something which nobody can hear, or at least not there, it's exactly the same thing when you're designing something which is not yet there. So you have to dare to look inside of yourself and to visualize, to visualize what you would like to see. And then, to, and then you have to create it. And of course, you don't know how to create it, so you have to learn it. And that's why you learn different computer programs or uh, craftsmanship or whatever, because you have this vision and then you have to hunt it until you can, it gets uh, realized in, as an object or if you're a musician as something you can hear. But also as a musician, you could say, if you're a really good musician, you're not playing music. Music is playing you. Uh, and 
a really good musician is somebody that just disappears. Uh, and I would say a really good designer is also somebody who's just disappearing. And what's left is just, uh, well, the product or how the, how the user is using it. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. And it's like when you learn a new program or something, it's like picking up a new instrument and uh, using that yes. to create a fuller, a fuller sound. I, I love that. Yes. I love that. And, and the audience should never ever hear how difficult it is to play this instrument or all the struggles you have been uh, through. That doesn't matter. Uh, they should just see, oh, this is natural. Or, wow, obviously, why didn't I do it myself? Exactly. You, you used a quote, only fools know what they're going to do. At what point do you transition from anything goes to sticking to a design and following it through uh, to completion? And I think that probably relates also to failure to a certain extent. But when do you, like, I mean, you're free, you're learning new instruments, you're, you're playing, you're creating the tune of, of whatever the design is gonna be. And at some point you just say, okay, this is the one, let's, let's go full force ahead. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I never try to judge what I do. And uh, I very often, I, uh, I'm more or less in love with the, any kind of idea or principle I find, I think, oh, this is just amazing, but I don't know it anymore. It can be some the worst bullshit. I don't know it. So I should not judge it. I should just try to, to bring the idea as far as I can. And then somebody else needs to take the judgment. Is it good or bad? Of course, I try to think, does this make more harm than good? And then I, I, I put it down. But... But but else I uh, I just try to um, give as much respect to the idea as I can, and then I will see what happens. Uh, but it's very much about being honest to it, and then listen to what people respond, of course. Um, but don't make any compromises. Um, but if somebody says something which is a better idea, then pick the better idea. Or if somebody says something, oh yeah, this makes sense, then make it better. So everything can be improved. But if you say, uh, if you make something which is, let's say, uh, red, and somebody wants it uh, completely uh, black, and somebody else wants it white, then the solution is not gray. That's a bad compromise. The solution could be pink or green or something. So whenever, you haven't got the solution, then find a better solution, but don't find compromises. And the better solution could very well be from the other side on the table. I Come that. from the other That's side of the table. kind of rare for a designer to be that open and understand the collaboration that goes forward. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons Louis Paulson had the, the, the confidence to, to create this latest light. It's, it's so innovative and so different and, and probably so timeless. Um, I love it. We, we talk about, trend versus nature mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned that you know the LED, te led technology was coming alive when you started now led yes. probably would be considered a trend right and how do you balance well, everybody on the planet going to led but you certainly were not trendy at all well i, I would say led is uh, it's i would say that's not trend that's technology and at a certain point, I thought that with the LEDs, it's possible to make completely different lamps than the one I made, because the one I made is basically made for a classic E27. I think in America, you call it E26 or something like that. Is it right? I'm um, not sure, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. Well, you know, this... Um, yeah, yeah, I just, I just forget the name. Yeah, the central light bulb. Uh, and... Um, with the LEDs, you can make boards uh, and you can make light in a completely different way. But uh, somehow, the, we still have the kind of lamps which I made. Uh, the good thing about this is because we, the light bulb is modular. So the light bulb will be obsolete at some time uh, because the, the development in this technology is going so fast that after maybe five years, you will find a better light bulb. So you just take out the light bulb, but you still have the lamp. Um, 
So in this way, having a modular light bulb, you can always have a, you can have a more or less timeless lamp, but also a lamp is more than technology is also kind of a symbolic uh, or ritual object, something you can look into just as you're glaring into a, a fire stall. So it's not only about lighting, it's also about giving atmosphere. Um, and then trend versus nature, I would say, um, if you always try to hint to get the latest trend, then of course you will always be behind because when you are out with the product, uh, the latest trend is somewhere else again. But if you're trying to find something, find something which is basically human, uh, then it will also be basically human five years from now or 10 years from now or 100 years from now because we are not changing that much. Right. Yeah, a rose is a rose is a rose. Um, yes. I love it. I love it. Um, I think one of the things I found very interesting and oftentimes for people hard to take is uh, your job is to critique your clients, that you don't look to placate a client, but to challenge a client. And uh, I was interested in how the many first meetings go and um, give examples where maybe that didn't go so well, because I think it's important and I think people are scared to do it. And I'd love you to teach people how important it is. Well, I would say the thing why it didn't went so well in the beginning was simply because I wasn't good enough. Uh, but I, I also challenge, uh, you know, my other clients such as Bang & Olof, which who make really world-class uh, uh, speaker systems and so on. And I think it's a very Danish thing as well, because our, the Danish society is very non-hierarchical. And if I do not challenge my clients, in Denmark at least, they don't take me seriously. Um, and we expect people, if I tell you something, I don't expect you to do it. I expect you to say, hey, wait, stop, what did you mean? And then to tell me if what I tell you does not make sense. Because either you have a problem or I have a problem or we have both a problem. But if we understand what it's all about, then we might be able to make a better decision. Uh, and I think to challenge uh, our client is, first of all, when a client comes to me and ask, asking for something, the client never knows what the client wants. The client thinks he or she knows what they want. And then in a way, I'm like a psychologist uh, or a therapist trying to say, oh, what if this, or what if this, or what if this? And during this process, we find out what the client wants. But nobody knows before you have been through this process. I don't know it myself either. So the process shows where we want to go, but nobody knows, I don't know it either. And the client does not know it either. Uh, I love that philosophy. And I, and I always worry that as companies get bigger, they lose that ability to, to be free. And I need to check you know, this box of a, a wall hanging X, X of this retail, da, 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 and you end up crimping the design process, you know? Um, I love that. Now, so, which leads me to your collaboration with Louis Paulson. And, you know, I think in every great collaboration, the designer learns from the uh, manufacturer, the manufacturer learns from the client. Can you give of us course. some examples of how you learn from them and they learn from you and, and it was like working together? Well, of course, uh, you know, working with, with, uh, with uh, Louis Paulson is very much about uh, Danish uh, design history and very much about uh, Paul Henningsen. Uh, he's this icon of, of Danish lighting design. Uh, and also his design philosophy is, uh, I would say it's very much aligned with uh, what I do. So it's not a problem for me at all to be inspired from what he's doing. But I think it really makes completely sense. Um, and then, uh, so one thing is history and to, uh, to learn from history, because basically what we do is based on experiences, decades, it's many lives of experience is something what we can uh, build uh, upon. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that's, uh, that's maybe the most important. Now I, I just lost my, the, it was about what they learned from you and what you learned from them during the collaboration. Ah, yeah. Yes, ah, yeah, yeah. yes, of course, of course. And then, of course, from re, for me, they learn, uh, I mean, the, the Patera is, is uh, they have never uh, used this kind of uh, manufacturing technology before. So the, the, the assembly process, the, the manufacturing process is something they have never been into. And uh, I think only because I made the first prototype myself, 
they dare to do it because to assemble the very first prototype took four or five days. And to make a, 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 a car takes 20, uh, 42 minutes. Uh, so of course, to make a commercial product that takes that long time to assemble is, is nonsense. And then, but I was really believing in it and that's why I continued. So I would say the manufacturers can learn from the designers because the designers are kind of stupid. We, we don't give up projects that are impossible uh, when we get the first uh, uh, resistance. Uh, so in a way we burn maybe a little bit more for a baby than, than the manufacturers. And in this way we are willing to take slightly bigger risk. And then of course they took over and, and they were refining the design. Uh, so from them I learned a lot about uh, you know, economy and, and of course light technique. And uh, they, for me, maybe learned something about uh, that I dare to do something all the experienced people would never, I go into some routes and passes the experienced would never go into because they think it's maybe their wisdom tells them this is crazy. I don't know it yet. And that's why I do it. And of course, I get a lot of uh, uh, bumps here and there. <laughs> but I also dare to go where because I don't know how stupid it is. And then sometimes I find a jewel. I, I love it. I love the light. And I give great credit to Louis Paulson for having the, the confidence in the design to execute something that looks super complicated, but yet is very durable. I watched you, you know, kind of almost break a piece off and it snaps back in. And I was truly blown away. That's a, a fantastic. And I love the Bose speaker. I, I think I, had the exclusive on some colorway early on at Design Within Reach when we launched it. And uh, I, I truly loved it. I, 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 when I first time I touched it and ran my finger over the top and, and saw the functionality, I was blown away. I also would very much like to buy the record player that you showed earlier. The one on your wall, I think that is spectacular. Yeah. We have to work on that. <laughs> uh, I guess- It's not in manufacturing. I would love it as well. It, it, it's not in production. Let's get that done. Let's get that done. Concept. Would be nice. <laughs> I love it. Um, so in closing, you know, you're young in your career, you've had great success. What's next? Like if you had a choice to design something, uh, it could be, you know, whether it's a, an automobile or a spaceship or a telephone, what, what, would, what would you think just if, if you had carte blanche, what would be the next design do you think? Uh, well, I think actually I have carte blanche. Well, that's the way how I design. I do really what I want to do. <laughs> And uh, the, the, but I don't have time to do everything, of course. But uh, one of my things is uh, I really would like to make something that makes people use less smartphones because I think the smartphones are horrible. Um, and uh, 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 well, I'm, I'm working on a small watch for the same purpose. Um, and uh, but also, I would like to make a Zeppelin, uh, what you call it, uh, yeah. a, a hot air balloon type of thing, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, I love that. Uh, so, and everything between, in between is something I would like to do. <laughs> but, but first of all, uh, I mean, as long as it makes sense somehow and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully does more good than bad. Well, fantastic. Which, I, I don't know before it's done. <laughs> I love this conversation. And I think uh, you, you made me so excited. I wish we had a lot more time, but I think now we're probably going to go to questions from the, uh, the digital audience uh, next. Yeah. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, good. Excellent, welcome back and, and what a nice view Thank you. Thank you, likewise. The chirping birds that are happy to be on the call as well. Yes. Yeah, so we're all taking a vacation with you for a minute. So thank you for taking time out. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I'm waiting for the q and I'm waiting for the questions. Let me just switch to the other. Okay, excellent. So here's the first question. Uh, for all the fixtures, do you always start from mock-up or a model? How do you control the light beam shape you want? Like uplight, omnilight, from Sing Tong. Well, that's a good question. Uh, when designing a lamp, it's all about the light. And I basically use the principles and um, uh, 
uh, methods from Paul Henningsen. Um, and so I, when I start to construct, I very often use a piece of paper or now very much in the computer. And in this way, you can use reflection, diffusion, a lot of different methods. And then I try to find out where I would I like the light to go. And this can all be constructed on a piece of paper, actually. But then with a computer, you can make it uh, also three-dimensional. So that's where I would where I start, always from, from the light source and outwards. Um, and then I do the prototypes and see how it looks in reality. Fascinating. So interesting. This is a question from William McLaughlin. These lights in form are very natural and human. Do you study circadian rhythm? And how do you incorporate this into your work? Uh, that's a good question. Well, the circadian rhythm, for those not knowing it, it is the fact that uh, daylight is not only light. Uh, the light is changing uh, during the entire day and night. Uh, so that in the morning, you have a more uh, short radiant light than in the evening which makes the morning light more kind of cold or uh, clear. And then during, before sunset, you have this warm, very atmospheric light. And this is very important because it tells your brain to uh, fall to sleep and it helps you to get a much better sleep. Uh, also that you know, during night it's dark, so it also helps your body to sleep. So circadian rhythm is something which is extremely important and very important for the future as well. Um, Mostly, um, um, circadian rhythm um, is something which is inside of the light bulb. And uh, I don't do the light bulbs. I've been involved in some LED projects, but mostly I do the screen and the shades um, around of the light bulb. Um, yes, so I do the shade, and then I trust that you put the right light bulb in it with which I hope will have a circadian rhythm in the future. And when I do LEDs, uh, then I always try to have the circadian rhythm as, a, as, a, as an integrated um, component. That's fascinating. I need to do a little more research myself on that and, and adjust my home properly. Uh, this question is from an anonymous attendee. What's something about lighting that many consumers don't understand or know? Well, I would say basically when you buy a, a light bulb, very often um, you only get the information of how much light it is producing. How, I mean, the, the intensity of light, the, the luminance, but that's actually, or how much it does, how many uh, lumen it is producing per uh, energy unit or per watt. Uh, and that's actually not very important, I would say. Well, it's, it's also important but um, the quality of light is much more important in my point of view. Um, and the uh, quality of, of uh, how the light is rendering colors is very important, especially if you have a kind of a light skin as Northern European people have, uh, because if we have a wrong light source, you don't see the red colors in our skin. You only see the green colors or, well, well you see all the other colors. But the fact is if you have a wrong light bulb, uh, you look uh, really sick and, and uh, many manufacturers that don't tell what kind of uh, the quality of light is. As a consumer, you should look, look after the CRI value or the RA value. And this should be above 90, I would say 90 plus. Is that easy to find? Uh, yes. Uh, well, not always because sometimes it's not on the package. Well, then uh, uh, tell the shop, hey, I want something which is more than 90 or 90 plus. Um, and um, it is absolutely possible to find it. And, and you can get it many places. Um, yes. And if you want to go really nerdy, then you can add some super uh, color rendering things. But normally, if you just go more than 90 or 95, then, it's, then you're all done. You know, I spent my entire adult life different moments approving color samples, whether it was leather for Edelman leather yeah. or, or, or products at, at, a, at Design Within Reach. And in order to even start the conversation with where I was comparing, we had to adjust lighting. 
And almost every major issue I had is the people didn't know what lighting they were using uh, to, to look at color because color changes so dramatically, like you were saying, with each type of light. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a question here from Jonathan K. Are there any lessons you take from nature which show you what not to design? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Allah, the stink of a skunk or the thorn in a rose, I guess. Sorry? I was thinking of the, the stink of a skunk or the thorn in a rose, you know, things that are natural, no, that mean, are functional. Yeah, but that's also very functional because it's a yeah. way how the rose is protecting itself. Um, you could say cancer might be a thing which is, could be hard to understand. I mean, why has nature this built-in failures? And, uh, well, I, I, I don't dare to come into this question because it has some ethical, uh, 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 well, it's, it's hard to discuss this. I would say nature is really something you, you, we should study and, and just learn and learn from the principles. Don't copy it, but study and, and uh, well, I would say I don't really know what I, I don't know if there's anything I can't learn from nature. Uh, I don't know it yet. I'm sure it is, but I, I haven't seen it. Super. I have another anonymous question. How long does it take from design until something goes to market? That, that's a broad question, but I think many people don't realize the, 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 the time frame, and it's different, I'm sure, for each type of project, but some, some general examples. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's very hard to give a general uh, answer to that because that's very much about the complexity of the problem, the the size of the company, uh, if they have done this kind of product before, or if all of us are on completely new land. Uh, I would say very often, I mean, it, it can easily take uh, maybe one and a half year. Um, a friend of mine has been working four years on, 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 a, on a chair, uh, which is now an extremely successful chair. Uh, and, and well, I, have not been I, think people, I think people don't realize how difficult it is to make a chair. I mean, in my experience, no, a chair is one of the most difficult things to produce. Well, the thing is, I mean, if, if when, you, when you're designing, the first 98% uh, only takes maybe a few weeks or sometimes even just some hours or minutes. But to get the last 2%, the, the, they can take months or years. Uh, because then you have to go back and forth and refine and, and, and so on. So that's, that's where the time is really running. The but that's also where you fit. see if something is good. Yeah, the fit is so important and hard to get for so many different body yes. types. Yes. Now, this is a name from a, a question from a name. I'm going to butcher the name, but it looks like uh, Bastian uh, Luchk. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you select materials for your designs? And how do you weight sustainability and renewable sources versus the functionality? That's a very good question. Also, very uh, different, uh, difficult question to answer. Uh, when you when when you uh, choose uh, materials, then of course now we have a uh, what you say. We don't have very much time to change our way how to manufacture because we have a, a, a global warming crisis. And for some, uh, actually, only some months ago, I thought that. The most important thing as a designer is to make to use materials which can be recycled. When you talk about recycling, it's not enough to talk about recycling. It should also be upcycled or at least not downcycled, so that you can recycle ever over and over and over again. But then I spoke with a material specialist who told me, "Hey, it's not enough to think about just recycling because some materials they require so much energy to." be manufactured in the first point, and then it's not as important how long they are lasting because you require so much energy to, 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 to manufacture it. So it's a very complex uh, question, and there you have to ask some experts. And of course, it's always about to make something using as little energy as possible, making it last as long as possible, and try to make it as recyclable as possible. And when you make lamps, then of course, it's very much about the light ability. So it should be reflective, diffusive, and so on. Um, but uh, it's, it's not easy to give one question. It's very complex, but we should all try our best and learn. I agree. And, and always study the, uh, 
the ripple effects of our decisions. Yes. Um, yeah, this is the last question. Yes. Um, it's an easy one. Uh, yeah. Any final statements you'd like to share with our audience, things we didn't cover, questions you wish you would have received? Uh, well, I think, I think you're, you're all good. Um, <laughs> mostly, I would say, if, uh, well, I, I would say there are a lot of really good designers, uh, but not all designers are allowed to be really good designers. So this could be maybe a statement for all the manufacturers that if you allow your designers to take the time required to, to do good stuff, then I will, I'm sure we'll see much better products out there. Excellent. Well, listen, on behalf of Be Original Americas, thank you so much. You're, you're, you're such a pleasure to speak with and, and uh, for, for the design nerds in the world like, like us, it's just a pleasure to learn from you. And um, exciting, every, every, everything, te everything that teaches us excites us. And, you really follow along with the Be Original America's mission of educating people about design, about the value of authenticity in design and the longevity in the, uh, of design as well when it's done right. Uh, everybody who's out there listening or watching, please join Be Original, renew Be Original, send Be Original a check. Um, we only survive because of you. We just finished the most amazing fellowship and, and had over 3,500 students educated about the value of great design. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to support, 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 and support authentic, authentic design. Um, it will always come back, it will always be strong. We appreciate you uh, so much and, uh, and take care. Thank you again, Oivan, you're the best. Thank you, and thank you for the conversation, John. <laughs> My pleasure.